All right, now just to get into our lesson, of course, uh, the Israelites have been wandering around the wilderness for how long? 40, 40, 40 years. Why did they wander for 40 years? Okay, they went against God. And remember the spies? The spies said, hey, we can't take the land. But, of course, after the 40 years, what were they doing? Taking the land. So they have learned at least that lesson. And really what, what we'll look at today, they're about ready to go into the land. And uh, Moses, let's go over to uh, Deuteronomy 34. Moses basically leads them. He, he didn't get to go into the land. Why, do you remember? Struck the rock, okay? Disobedience. It's really the Lord's in control. When you think about it, it's kind of wow. After all those years, he did that one mistake. Oof. And uh, wasn't able to go in the land because of that. I mean, can you imagine, humanly speaking, Moses, I'm sure he desired what? Finish it off. Let's go into the land. And, uh, you know, because a lot of times that's how it is. You like to finish things off, right? Especially something like that. And, of course, who leads him into the land? Joshua. All right, Joshua. And so you look at Deuteronomy 34. Moses went up from the plains of Moab to the mountain of Nebo to the top of Pisgah that is over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead to Dan, all Naphtali, land of Ephraim, Manasseh, and all the land of Judah, utmost sea. Okay. In the south, in the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of the palm trees, and to Zor. And the Lord said to him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, and to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy sea. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. Of course, you look at that, and uh, you get all these things, and you really think about it. Moses is writing all this. How is he able to write about his death? God told him. Why? Why? You think about the Word of God. Word of God is what? Is it just man writing? Whatever I want to write? What They're inspired, which means what? For maybe not everyone to understand it. It's God, God breathed, so it's what? God's Word. So God told him. God told him. So, because sometimes people say, well, how could he do it? He was, he was dead. Well, he did it before he died. And God is able to do that because God is God. I mean, if God can open up the Red Sea, I'm sure he can tell Moses what's going to happen at the end of his life. Okay? Those types of things. And so you think about it. Joshua then takes the rain. Of course, Joshua, what, who was he? Well, he was one of the spies, right? And uh, he wanted to take the stand. He said, hey, let's go into the land. And because of that, God blessed him. Not only him, but God blessed who else? Caleb, Joshua and Caleb, Joshua Caleb. And, uh, and so really that's, that's what we'll be looking at. Looking at the historical books, there are 12 books that are the historical books. Joshua all the way through Esther. And so we'll, we'll look at some of these. And of course, you know, as you uh, now move over to Joshua chapter 1, it says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore rise. Go over this Jordan, thou and all this people unto the land which I do give to them. Okay? And so you can see Joshua is now taking, taking over, and they're finally going to go into the promised land. But before they go into the promised land, do you remember what happened? He said, send some spies, right? Oh, there's another test, those spies. Last time they had spies, 
Not a good thing. Now you got more spies going to go into the land. And of course they go and they spy out what city? Jericho, Jericho. And of course we have the story of Rahab. But probably some of the most famous verses uh, of Joshua would be in chapter 1, verse 6. Verse 6, you think about that, it says, Be strong and of good courage, for into this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance. It says there, Be strong and of good courage. And a lot of times we'll see that and it talks about, you know, be, being strong. Verse 7, you see that, strong, very courageous. Another verse there, many of us know, verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate there in day and night. So those, those are some things that God is telling um, Joshua to do. And, of course, as he obeys, and we, we think about Joshua Really nothing negative against Joshua throughout all of Scripture. Joshua many times is also a picture of who? Jesus Christ. Okay. And uh, so these, these are some things that uh, we want to remember. Now, we'll have a little video that we'll watch. I figure it would be a little different today. Uh, but as we think about going into the city, though, uh, because many of you remember the story. We'll say some things maybe after the video. But um, as you think about it, you have someone that helps the spies. It was, of course, everyone. Rahab, okay? Rahab, of course, was not necessarily considered the most moral individual, but uh, God still used her. She became very much famous. She's mentioned even in the New Testament where... Right, the lineage of Christ. So here's an individual that you would look at and go, how in the world does she get in there? Um, but God used her in a special way. Of course, uh, she tells the men uh, to do what? Well, she hides them. And then one of the things that you'll go over in college in ethics class is uh, always, was it a lie? Okay, and uh, so there's always those things. It's always one of those interesting things. Uh, we could spend maybe an hour trying to discuss all those things. Um, but uh, as that happens, of course, there's always questions about, you know, how the city was destroyed, all the different things. And as you remember, what, what happened to the city? All right, the walls fell. Okay, do you remember how they fell? Okay, they were, of course, they marched around. I believe what they said, the, the walls fell out. Okay, not in. Um, and uh, just an interesting concept. So what we're going to do this morning, we're going to watch a little video. It's 14 minutes, 14 minutes. Hopefully it all works well. If not, I'll be up. All right, go ahead and hit the Lord willing. But what about the final step of that sequence? The conquest of Canaan, the land that had been promised to Abraham and his descendants. Would the earlier pattern of evidence continue there as well? The children of Israel leave Egypt. They travel to Mount Sinai, where they received God's law and made a covenant to be his people. Then after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, Moses transferred his authority to Joshua and ascended the heights of Mount Nebo, and there he died. The Israelites had been waiting centuries for the promise to be fulfilled, and now it was Joshua who would lead them in their conquest of Canaan. The land of Canaan was very different from Egypt. It was a land ruled by many independent city-states with names like Hazor, Jericho, Hebron, and Arad. The history of these cities has been divided into two major time periods, the Middle Bronze Age, matching Egypt's Middle Kingdom, 
when they were thriving and fortified by high walls. Then a sudden destruction and burning came upon the land, leaving those cities in ruins and bringing in a new period known as the Late Bronze Age, matching the time of Egypt's new kingdom. Archaeologist Norma Franklin represents a large group of scholars that sees no evidence for a biblical conquest of the promised land. As an archaeologist, I hate to disappoint people, but we have no evidence for a single mass migration of people from one country over a period of 40 years wandering and coming into another country. There is destruction. Amazing destructions. None of them actually fit one another. They all happened within a hundred years, but not, over, but not overnight. Not what you, you'd expect in, you know, Joshua didn't live that long <laughs> if he existed, <laughs> okay. First and foremost, many places which are mentioned in the Joshua, in the conquest uh, story, specifically mentioned, you know, as major places in Canaan, were excavated and uh, no evidence for a city in the late Bronze Age has ever been found. And I'm speaking about major excavations. And we are speaking about many sites. It's uh, systemic. It's not only a single site. This is a serious problem with the conquest. If it really happened in the late Bronze Age. But again, what if it happened in the earlier Middle Bronze Age? It seemed only logical to begin by looking at the key site of Jericho, the first city the Israelites are said to have destroyed. And we know exactly where that was. Major archaeological excavations at Jericho began with a German team in the early 1900s led by Ernst Selling. This was followed by a British team headed by John Garstang in the 1930s. At the time of their digs, both Selling and Garstang believed they had uncovered a layer of destruction that matched the biblical story. However, things took a dramatic turn when Kathleen Kenyon dug at Jericho in the 1950s. She demonstrated that there was no evidence for a destruction of Jericho matching the biblical account because she dated the demise of the city much earlier. A wave of skepticism began to sweep across the field of archaeology. In an instant, Kenyon's discoveries at Jericho had undermined the entire Exodus story. She was expecting that if there was any evidence there at all, it would be in what we call the Late Bronze Age. And it simply isn't there. If the Israelites had arrived in the 13th century, they'd have found almost nobody there, no walls to collapse. It just wouldn't have fitted the biblical narrative. So her excavations helped to compound this, this very negative view that was developing, not just from Jericho, but from other sites as well. Is there a time when Jericho was destroyed? where the walls fell down or it was burned. I don't think so. I don't think, I don't think that we have evidence, uh, uh, this, this kind of evidence in, uh, in the case of Jericho. And I don't think that we can really look for this evidence. We are very much past this phase of uh, archaeological research. But David Roll sees things differently. If people are telling us that there was no Jericho at the time that Joshua conquered the Promised Land, and therefore Joshua is a piece of fiction, and therefore the conquest is a piece of fiction, and then probably Exodus is a piece of fiction as well. If that's the case, why don't we ask the simple question, well, when was Jericho around? When was Jericho destroyed? And start from that point of view. The conquest began with the Israelites crossing the Jordan River. Joshua sent men to spy out the massively walled city of Jericho. And there they met a harlot named Rahab, who reported that all in the land had heard what God had done for the Israelites, and they were terrified. Rahab hid the spies and aided their escape to the mountains. What evidence do you see matching the conquest of Jericho? First of all, we're told that Jericho was fortified. When the archaeologists dug the city, particularly Kathleen Kenyon, when she did her work in the 50s, discovered that the tell that the city's built on was surrounded by a great earthen rampart. Excavators found that Jericho was protected by a brilliant defensive system. At its base was a stone retaining wall more than 15 feet high, with a defensive extension wall of mud bricks rising higher still. Beyond this was the rampart, 
a steep slope covered with a slick surface of white plaster, where attackers would have been exposed to arrows and sling stones from above. At the top of this rampart was the main city wall, also made of mud brick, this one more than 25 feet high and 10 feet thick. Imagine the dread and the desperate panic of the people of Jericho. Day after day for six days, the people of Israel are walking around their city with the Ark of the Covenant and the sounding of ram's horns. Then on the seventh day, they encircle the city seven times and the priests give a long blast on their horns. The people let loose with a mighty shout. The walls come tumbling down. to climb up into the city, taking it and commencing the conquering of the land of Israel. Well, when the city met its end, uh, these mud brick walls collapsed and they actually uh, fell down to the base of the stone retaining wall. Kenyon describes it very uh, clearly and in detail in her excavation report. And then we're told they set the city on fire. And that's exactly what we find. Jericho was massively destroyed by fire. Kenyon said it was very clear that within the city, the walls of the buildings had fallen as well. And she says that the walls fell before the fire. And so we have the sequence that we read in the Bible. First, the fallen walls, and then the city being set on fire by the Israelites. Excavations at the site uncovered clear evidence for a massive destruction by fire with a very thick burn layer of extremely high temperatures. This caused Kenyon to attribute the burning to an enemy attack and not fires that would result solely from an earthquake. She claimed that the city was destroyed uh, around 1550 BC by the Egyptians. Well, there's absolutely no evidence that the Egyptians were ever in the Jordan Valley at this time period. So because Kenyon dated the destruction of Jericho 150 years before the Israelites were supposed to be there, she made no connection between the destruction and the biblical account. But once again, this date fits the earlier pattern I've been seeing. Within the city, a very unique discovery was made. Both Garstang and Kenyon found in the houses that they excavated many jars full of grain that were stored there. The store jars in the city were pretty full. That suggests the harvest had only recently been gathered in. And the details in the biblical account point to an event that happened sometime in the spring. And down there in the Jordan Valley, spring is when the harvest is gathered in, the grain harvest. When the Israelites crossed the Jordan, the first thing they did was celebrate Passover. Well, when is Passover? Again, the spring of the year. The full jars also indicate that if this was a siege, it was very short, unusual for a strong fortified city such as Jericho. And that matches the biblical account because the siege was only seven days. Otherwise, the people inside would have consumed a lot of that grain if it dragged out for months. Was the grain found all over the city? Yes. In every house that was excavated, they found jars of grain. There's one other intriguing detail at Jericho that fits the Bible remarkably well. It had to do with a promise made to Rahab. She actually lived in the city wall. And after hiding the spies, they promised her that she and her family would be protected when they attacked the city. And they kept their promise. She had marked her home with a scarlet cord, which she hung out the window. But if her house was built into the city wall, how could it have survived? I came across the actual archaeological report that the German excavator of Jericho, Ernst Sellen, had published in 1913. He was the first to conduct a major excavation of the site, and I could see that his work was impressive. 
but now seem to have been forgotten. Here were detailed plans and photographs, including one part of the site, which echoed the Rahab story in an unexpected way. The Germans found that in this one short stretch on the north side of the city, there were houses built on the rampart between the lower city wall and the upper city wall, and some of those houses were built right up against the lower city wall. They found that the city wall did not fall in this area. So that provides an explanation for how the spies could have saved Rahab and her family because God brought the wall down everywhere else except where her house was, and we have archaeological evidence to back that up. Well, what if people say, well, you're biased? Uh, I think everybody in the field is biased, one way or another. I admit my bias. However, I cannot make up the evidence. I cannot plant it in the ground. I have analyzed it and compared it to the Bible, and I see, wow, it matches exactly. That's science. Look at your evidence and come to a conclusion based on the evidence. Archaeologists have uncovered a city with high fortification walls that fell down. Evidence that the city was intentionally burned after the collapse. Storage jars filled with charred grain evidence of a short siege in springtime. And a section of houses within the wall, miraculously preserved, just as in the biblical account. According to the biblical account, Joshua spoke a curse against anyone who would rebuild the city of Jericho. And the archaeology shows that after the destruction, the city of Jericho was indeed abandoned for centuries. But of course, this all happens in the wrong time in the view of most scholars. Bryant Wood believes that Kenyon misdated the pottery of Jericho, resulting in a wrong destruction date. He, along with Charles Ayling, believe that the conquest occurred around 1400 BC using the conventional dates for Egypt and Canaan. However, David Roll and John Bimson have a different idea. They propose that Kenyon came to a wrong destruction date at Jericho because the dates assigned to the Middle Bronze Age are not correct, and these dates for history need a major adjustment. Regardless, all these scholars agree that Jericho was destroyed in a manner that matches the story of Joshua and the Israelites. All right, just gives you a little more information on that. And uh, of course, what would you say about these informa this information when someone says, hey, we, we don't believe that event took place, of course, we would say what? The word of God is true. So um, it's, yeah, it's always, we would take it as truth. Some would say, well, that's, that's kind of a shallow argument, but um, we also get to heaven by what? Faith. It's all by faith. So that's one of those things because sometimes you're going to find people, of course, they want to prove their argument also. That's what he's saying there, the gentleman. You know, he, he has his thoughts, but the other person has their thoughts, and many times their thoughts might be trying to prove the Bible wrong. Okay, so you, you have both arguments there. And, um, but again, it's one of those things as we get into the book of Joshua and the, the issue is this, they obeyed God. You think about 40 years early, earlier, they, God said, take the land. The people said, no, we're afraid. Now you've got these spies going in. And of course, as you could see, the city of Jericho, what kind of city was it? Well, it was pretty complex, wasn't it? Um, if you were a soldier, I don't know about you, but uh, thinking about, okay, I'm going to go over that first wall, and then I get to run up the next wall uh, with arrows being shot at me. That sounds exciting. Um, not too exciting. But God, of course, did a miracle. And that also takes a step of faith, doesn't it? 
How does it take a step of faith? Well, just imagine. All right, guys, let's all line up. I want you all line up, and we all start marching, you know, and uh, we're walking around a city. What's going through your heads? Crazy. Waste of time. All right, I've got better things to do. Um, so, so, yep, right, <laughs> right, right. But it was a step of faith that they at least said what? We're going to have to do it just like looking at a snake. Just look at a snake. Because when you think about it, why are we doing this? Well, because God said to do it. That's why we're doing it. We do it. And then he said, march around the last day seven times. So here we are. And I mean, again, you, you have to say, they're following, they're obeying. And uh, as Roy is saying, they had learned some lessons, didn't they? Hey, we better obey. We don't want to be walking around in the wilderness another 40 years. Right, yeah, yeah, so they, and that's really what happens, and think about your own life, I think for all of us, you know, there, have we done foolish things? Yes, we've done foolish things, just like the Israelites, hopefully with time we do what? Learn, learn just like the nation, so when God says march around, even though humanly speaking it might sound like hey, this is, this is kind of a foolish thing, they just say what? Hey, we're going to do it because God said it and uh, we're going to obey. So, now, as you think about it, we can learn a couple of different things uh, from this. We, all, we understand how did Ray, I, I should start saying it like they say in the Rahab, Rahab, okay. Um, <laughs> But Rahab, how, how did she uh, demonstrate her faith? Again, most of us know the story. Maybe not everyone does. But she, of course, demonstrates her faith how? Okay. All right. That is, that's correct. And also... Well, what did she do with the, the spies? She hit them. And is that a risk? Yeah, it's a big risk. Right. Yeah. And she, get, you know, she hides them. And that, that's a risk of life, right? Because what, what happens after she hides them? Well, the soldiers show up, okay? And so she had to make that decision, hey, I'm going to help these guys. And she was willing to help them. Why? Well, Terry kind of said, but as you remember, they knew what the Israelites had done, okay? They had heard what had been happening in the days before. And so she, she of course, took that. And uh, that's how, um, you know, she demonstrates her faith. Now, how did the spies demonstrate their faith? Okay. That's correct. And so, also, just going, you know, as you think before, they had not followed, but here they're, they're willing to follow. Now, uh, you think about Rahab, um, you know, we don't want to spend too much time on this, but uh, when is it right or acceptable to tell a lie? It's always one of those, as I would say, we I remember in college, spent a day looking at this. Um, when is it 
right to tell a lie. And, you know, there is some thoughts about it. You never really see, just so you know. Um, well, let's, let's, go, let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. And, of course, Hebrews 11 is, is known as what? Okay, it's the faith, faith chapter. And uh, of all these individuals that are, are mentioned about their faith. And uh, let's look at verse uh, 31. And it says, By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. And of course, you know, a couple things as you would read about Rahab. Really, uh, nowhere in Scripture commends her lie or what she said. As you see, what, it, what is it always, like in verse 31, what does it talk about? about hiding the spies. That doesn't say anything about her words, different things like that, so as you go through it. And uh, of course, as I would say, there could be many thoughts on it. Of course, we don't have time to debate these types of things. Um, but, uh, you know, there are a lot of things, of course, uh, for her, uh, even in James chapter 2, verse 25, it talks about Rahab had demonstrated her faith, and uh, even in James. But also, we, we could give a lot of verses just about lying, because we would also say, hey, lying is, is wrong. Yes, sir? Right, yeah, she had peace and, yeah, yeah. And I think it was, you know, and that's where you get into it. She, she followed God. She took those steps of faith. And, um, you know, we, we would just look at it that way. She's following God. She, she's willing to obey. She obeyed how? She took the robe and put it out the window her family was important. God remembered those things. God spared, spared them. And, uh, you know, there's always that wonderful picture because you always see, what, the, the scarlet robe that goes through, even there. And that's, of course, one of the wonderful things about that picture. And so, wonderful story. Is it a true story? Yes, true story. Because again, it's not one of those fake make-believe things. Um, and that's one of the things, even with the video, even those who tried to necessarily say, hey, this one doesn't add up, the point was there was a destruction in Jericho. They are really more arguing about what time, the time, hey, when did it actually happen? Well, they all could say there was destruction and there was actually fire. And there was a big wall. And it, some of you remember maybe as a child about the walls. What do you remember as a child? It was a big wall. It was how big? Any of you remember? Okay. They could ride their chariots around it, around the top. Some of you remember that. So it was a very large one. And of course, the point be, meaning that the walls went out, how in the world does the wall goes out if the Israelites are going in. Well, most likely you're pushing in, right? But uh, God would have done that, so the walls are, are coming out. And so, wonderful picture. Of course, here it is. We've been almost two years in all of this, a year and a half. Uh, finally getting through Genesis, the Israelites are wandering around, all the different pictures that we have of Joseph, different things like that. Moses dies, and finally they're going to go into the Promised Land. What's so important about the promised land? Well, that was part of the what? Covenant. God is fulfilling his covenant. God's fulfilling his promise. And uh, it took all these years. Sometimes we need to remember that. 
doesn't necessarily happen on our time, does it? God has his plan, and uh, we just have to understand when God says he'll do certain things, he will do it. Okay? But it would be in his time. And uh, so important, important things for us to remember. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for this story as we think about it. The wonderful thing is we've gone so many months of just looking at the children of Israel wandering through the wilderness, uh, the miracles, different things like that. But here, finally, um, they're willing to obey. And uh, God, uh, you can still do those things in all of our lives. And Lord, uh, we pray that uh, you would bless here this morning with our service. Just uh, speak to us. Help us to be able to take some of these things, apply them to our lives. We do pray for all the other uh, aspects of our ministry here with the music, the junior church, and different things like that. You would uh, speak even to the children here this morning. I pray that you would bless. We thank you for all you've done in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you very much.